Okay, thanks. Uh, I want to begin by thanking the organizers, especially Amit, Ugo, Tal, Guy, and Shafi for allowing me to be here. This talk will be about a research area whose central goal is a deployable system or deployable systems for verifiable computation and more generally probabilistic proofs, arguments, snarks, snarks, etc. And my goal in this talk as an applied CS person is to motivate the next theoretical steps in this area. And I want to do that both by conveying excitement and also by applying a bit of a reality check. <laughs> OK, so the high level setup in this area is the following. We want to arrange for a client or verifier to send a description of a computation f and some input x to a server or prover who returns the output y along with the short proof that establishes for the client that y is the correct output given the input x. More generally, if f takes non-deterministic input, the proof should establish that the prover knows a witness that is a setting of the non-deterministic input to the validity of the pair x, y. The motivation for this setup is the general lack of trust in third-party computing. As an example, we'll see more later, but as an example, you can imagine that a client wants assurance that a query that's performed on a remote database was done correctly. Now, the area has several requirements, beginning with efficiency, which decomposes, first of all, into the running time for the verifier. We want it to be constant or logarithmic in the running time of the computation f. Likewise, for the communication cost and the number of rounds. That's the ideal. The server's running time should ideally be linear or quasi-linear in the number of steps required to execute F. Now, a second requirement is that in some applications, it will be desirable for the prover's auxiliary input, or the witness W, to be private to the verif from the verifier. And variants of this setup, as well as non-trivial subsets of these properties, have been achievable in theory, including constructions like interactive proofs, arguments of various kinds, zero-knowledge arguments of various kinds, and so forth. But there's an additional requirement that frames this area, and it's that we want all of this to be practical. And what I mean by practical may not be what cryptographers <laughs> mean by practical, but suffice it to say that on the practicality front, there's been good news and bad news. So the good news is that there's been a lot of attention to this area. What I'm depicting on the left is every publication I'm aware of that's reported on an implementation of a probabilistic proof protocol. If I have left one out, please let me know. I've strived to be comprehensive. So this includes the work of Elie Ben Sasson and Iran Tromer, Alessandro Chiesa, Daniel Genkin, Madars Verza. It includes the work of Babes Papamanthu and Elaine Shi over here. It includes the work of my group in various places, Justin Thaler and Michael Mitzenmacher, and Brian Parno and Craig Gentry uh, as well. So the other excitement, besides just the sheer amount of activity, is that there's been some genuinely cool results. There have been cost reductions of 20 orders of magnitude relative to naive implementations of the theory. Compilers, compilers in the sense of an implementation that go from programs expressed in a high-level language to binaries that implement the protocol entities. Extensions of the machinery to broaden expressiveness to computations that work over remote state and so forth. And most of the systems on the right of the slide have verifiers that are genuinely and concretely efficient. I also cannot resist telling you about uh, one of the papers done by my group appeared at SOSP, which is the premier operating systems venue. And I think it's fair to say that this was a landmark uh, for the area, or a milestone at least. But it was also a milestone for SOSP, because the system that we sent there was not remotely practical. Now, we were, we were very upfront about that, but that brings me to the bad news for this area. And the bad news is that just because something's implemented does not mean it's practical. And in fact, all of the systems on the right of the slide here suffer from the limitation that they have. They can only handle small computations. They have outrageous expense and so forth. So what that means is that for the time being, this machinery is limited to carefully selected particular kinds of applications, which I consider to be bad news given the promise of the area. So that sets up the rest of the talk. I'll describe the state of the art systems and then also perform a bit of a reality check and use these things to motivate what I hope would be the next theoretical steps in the area, since I think that foundational work is required. OK, in summarizing the state of the art, uh, I wish to observe that all of these systems decompose into a front end and a back end. The front end takes as input a high level description of a computation, for example, in the C programming language, and outputs an arithmetic circuit over a large finite field. 
the back end is a probabilistic proof protocol by which the prover can convince the verifier that there is a satisfying assignment to that arithmetic circuit. And it was the job of the front end to produce the circuit in such a way that the satisfiability of that circuit, roughly speaking, is tantamount to correct program execution. Now, the probabilistic proof protocols that have been refined and implemented include interactive arguments, non-interactive arguments of various kinds, snarks, snarks, et cetera, as well as interactive proofs. For lack of time, I'm unfortunately not going to be able to describe in detail the refinements that have been done to the exciting work of Goldwasser, Kalai, and Rothblum, I'll have to, which was done by <coughs> principally Justin Thaler. Um, but I will restrict focus to arguments. And when we restrict focus to arguments, all of the systems have as one of their central constructions the quadratic arithmetic programs of GGPR, Gennaro Gentry, Parno, and Rakova. In order to explain the role of QAPs, I'm going to walk through a series of straw men, or we could say bad ideas, for probabilistic proof protocols. So the first thing you could imagine doing, those of you who are graduate students who have you know, taken a complexity theory class, you're like, well, uh, PCPs are pretty awesome. They allow us to check things. So what we're going to do is have the prover materialize the an asymptotically efficient PCP, send it to the verifier. And we know that PCPs have the property that if the computation was done correctly, the verifier accepts. And if the computation was not done correctly, the verifier is highly unlikely to accept the proof. And the verifier's work here in checking the proof in the number of locations where it has to inspect is very low. The problem with this picture, though, is that the prover has to encode the satisfying assignment in the proof, which means that the proof is actually larger than the satisfying assignment, which means that on the basis of communication and running time at the verifier, we don't meet the efficiency requirement from the first slide. So the next thing you can imagine doing is saying, well, rather than have the prover send the proof to the verifier, what we could do is just have the prover materialize the proof and then have the verifier ask the prover what values the proof contains at particular locations. And this is the paradigm of Killian's arguments and Macaulay's computational soundness proofs. This is actually an excellent idea in principle. The problem is that the constants that attend the constructions of short PCPs make this approach very difficult, among other issues, the underlying alphabet here is not a great fit for the arithmetic circuit model of computation. Iran, uh, who will be speaking next, can probably tell you more about this, since I know that he and Eli Ben Sasson and Alessandro Chiesa actually implemented this stuff, although they haven't reported on experimental results. So I, I don't know precisely what issues they ran into, but I think this is it. So. The next thing you can imagine doing uh, is to turn to a really cool idea of Ishai Kushalevitz and Ostrovsky, a, a subset of whom are in this room. Maybe, uh, maybe it is uh, all of them. And the observation is the following. There's, there's really three pieces of this. The first is that in so-called simple PCPs, or bad idea PCPs, that appear in the first half of the PCP th uh, theorem in the ALMSS paper, these, these constructions are actually very simple. They're, they're quite straightforward to implement. The second observation uh, is that even though these proofs would rely, if they were materialized in full, or, or they would require the construction of an exponentially large table, there's actually a much more succinct representation of such proofs as a function, namely a linear function, function that takes as input a vector and returns the dot product of this vector v. v here encodes the satisfying assignment. And the final observation of IKO is that it's possible to get the prover to commit to a function of this form. The idea then is that the verifier asks the prover what values the proof contains at particular locations. But it's not just that the proof doesn't have to travel to the verifier. It's also that the prover only has to compute the locations in the proof that are asked for on demand, which means neither party incurs the exponential blow up. There are, so the advantage to this is that it's simple. You could imagine implementing it. My group actually did in some of the earlier works in this area. The constants are favorable. There's two issues, though. The first is that because the proof is exponentially sized, the locations where the verifier wants to inspect it for the verifier to communicate those to the prover requires itself a very long string, which in turn means that we have to work in a pre-processing model where the verifier has to generate these queries offline and then amortize the work of doing that over multiple instances of the same circuit here. The second disadvantage to this approach, which I'm going to sweep under the rug for the time being, is that this vector v that you would use in the naive implementation or application of this is actually quadratically larger than the satisfying assignment, and hence the running time of the computation. <laughs> 
But this picture sets up another idea, which is super cool, due to Batansky, Chiesa, Ishai, Ostrovsky, and Peneth. And their observation is the following. If you're willing to weaken the prover, the cheating prover, and assume that it's restricted to being able to perform only certain operations in ciphertext, then it's possible to have that picture from the previous slide, but in a non-interactive context. So this picture doesn't dispense with pre-processing, but that pre-processing cost can be incurred once and then reused over all future instances of the same computation rather than over a batch. And in this approach, those queries that I mentioned earlier are actually encrypted. It may not even be the verifier that has to incur the work to do it. There are variants of this where a third party can do it. Iran uh, has done work on that front, and it's super interesting. The prover's responses look very similar to what they did in the other context, except they're happening in cipherspace here. So the disadvantage now to this approach is that besides the restriction on the prover, which you know, may or may not be an issue depending on your philosophy, is that the prover's work required to actually participate in this protocol is still quadratic. And I'm going to address that in a moment, but I want to just kind of put all of these on the same spectrum uh, and thank Raphael Pass for kind of suggesting a, a figure of this kind. So if you look, we started with short PCPs. We moved to arguments, which introduced the assumption of collision-resistant hash functions. We then actually made a stronger cryptographic assumption, or IKO did, and my own group refined it, where we commit to a longer PCP. This introduces the downside of preprocessing, but the key advantage of simplicity and plausible constants. And then that same picture can be realized in a non-interactive way, which gets rid of the issue of amortizing only over a batch. But we still have the issue that the prover's work is quadratic. I'm going to restrict focus now to these two uh, approaches, because I think these are kind of the, the way things work now. So we're going to exploit the quadratic arithmetic programs of, or QAPs of GGPR. And I don't have time to go into the details of uh, QAPs, but what they are is a way of encoding a circuit as a set of univariate high-degree polynomials in such a way that if the circuit's satisfiable, a particular algebraic relationship holds among the polynomials, namely one polynomial divides another. And that that algebraic relationship can be checked probabilistically. And furthermore, that that probabilistic check actually has a linear query structure. Up, up, exploiting that fact leads to the following picture. This vector v that the prover would have otherwise had to materialize as being quadratic now becomes just h here is a, some stuff I'm not going to talk about that's quasi-linear in z. z is the satisfying assignment to the circuit. So the prover's work now is shrunk enormously. And this was a critical development in this research area. I should say, though, in fairness to GGPR as well as BCIOP, the fact that GGPR has a PCP, a linear PCP structure, is something that was not explicit in their paper. That connection was drawn in work by Batansky, Chiesa, Shai, Ostrovsky, and Peneth, as well as in work by my group. We expressed this result in different uh, vocabulary, but I think it was fair to say that both were vigorously expressed. So what this leads to is the following picture. The foundation of all of the argument backends is QAPs. Then the queries can take place in plain text, or they can take place in the exponent. The backend that implements the approach on the left, my group calls Zatar. We're systems people, so we don't name things after uh, our authors' names. We, name, you know, we pick other names just to confuse you. And you can think about this as an interactive argument that refines the protocol of IKO. The approach on the right is what is now known as a SNARG or zero-knowledge SNARK with pre-processing. GGPR kind of stands at the end of several other works, and it was implemented by Brian Parno, Craig Gentry, John Howell, and Mariana Rakova in a system called Pinocchio, and then optimized in a very nice piece of uh, work and engineering by uh, Ben Sasson, Chiesa, Tromer, and Virsa in what is a, a released software library called LibSNARK. There's a question that arises when you see this picture, which is, can we dispense with the pre-processing? And it turns out that it's absolutely possible. Batansky, Kennedy, Kies, and Tromer, uh, in, in several works from, I guess this dates back to 2011, um, but you can correct me, uh, Iran, if I'm, I'm wrong about that, show that it is possible to dispense with pre-processing by applying this picture recursively. The problem, though, is that as the experimental results in some of this later work, again, by subsets of these authors, makes clear these works really should be considered theory. I mean, there are many orders of magnitude more expensive than the other approaches. So to just compare the back end on the left with the back end on the right, effectively, the one on the right uses 
slightly stronger cryptographic assumptions and in return gets much better cryptographic properties, such as non-interactivity, the ability for the pre-processing work to amortize indefinitely, and also zero knowledge variance. And one really nice thing, which comes out of GGPR actually, is that the cost of providing zero knowledge is effectively zero, which is very cool and it has to do with the details of their construction. So the reason that I'm emphasizing that all of the systems are based on GGPR is that even though the systems are analyzed somewhat differently and they have different cryptographic, uh, different cryptographic properties, the mechanics are very similar and in fact are a source of cost. And so it's worth identifying that commonality. OK, so now moving to state of the art front ends, there's this effectively two different approaches. One approach is to treat the circuit as the unrolled execution of a general purpose processor and to compile a C program to a binary in the instruction set of that processor and then supply that binary as the input to the arithmetic circuit. So this is a kind of universality. This work was done by, uh, again, Iran and his co-authors, Eli Ben Sasson, Alessandro Chiesa, et cetera. Now, the advantage, this is extremely interesting and fascinating. Uh, the advantage to this is that the pre-processing work is now incurred only once for all computations of the same length because they're able to reuse that circuit, which is super cool. It's also the case that they have excellent programmability because having represented a general purpose CPU in the circuit, they can now handle any program that compiles to general purpose CPU, which is all of them. The downside is that the universality has a price. The other approach, which uh, was done or, or is followed by my group as well as the, the Pinocchio system due to Brian Parno et al., as well as work done by Babis Papamanthu and Elaine Shi, as well as the um, uh, Iran's uh, zero cache work, which I think he'll talk about, is to compile C programs to circuits directly, a tailored circuit for the computation in question. Effectively, the advantages of, and disadvantages are the inverse of the ones above. The circuits are much more concise because the circuit is tailored to the computation. The amortization is worse because the pre-processing has to be incurred for each different circuit in play. And you might think, and there is a, a question here, this, this subset of C, uh, sorry, this C program in all of the systems in this part of the picture is a subset of C. And so that raises the question, how restrictive is the subset of C? And I'll answer that question in the context of depicting a landscape of the front ends. So what you have here is most of the front ends that appear in the literature, and there's a trade-off between programmability and cost. So up and to the right is more programmability in terms of expressiveness that the machinery can handle and lower cost. And the ASIC approaches, the ones that are like ASICs are up here, the ones that are like CPUs are down here. At this point, there's a, a question. The approaches over here are not good at handling dynamic uh, loops where loop bounds are, become known only at runtime. There are other issues as well. They have problems with control flow and so forth, whereas the approaches over here do not have that restriction, but they carry more cost. So the question is, is it possible to get the best of both worlds? And in work uh, that we call Buffet, done in my group, we find that, in fact, is possible to get the best of both worlds. Buffet has almost the same expressiveness as the CPU-based approaches, the limitation being that the subset of C that it accepts does not handle function pointers. Um, and it has excellent, or excellent by comparison costs. Ideally, some of you could do work that would push this frontier up and to the right further. OK, so this is the common framework. We have back ends based on QAPs, different approaches to the front end. And I now want to perform a little bit of a reality check. And yeah? Question about the <clears throat> programmability, the, the, the two-dimensional picture you showed. So I mean, how, how important is it to develop cryptographic protocols that satisfy uh, you know, more expressive language, that handle more expressive language versus sort of handling that work at a kind of at a compiler level and asking a compiler to pre-compile you know your favorite program into so uh, this is <clears throat> for example when you compile to you ask the compiler to remove function pointers uh, does that, that uh, does that, uh, is that is that just like an insane blow up in, in complexity or Okay, so I can't quite tell whether you could be asking two things, maybe more. But the two things you could be asking are, if we're willing to restrict the front end, does that allow us to employ cheaper back ends? Or you could be asking if we're restricting the class 
of program constructs, does that mean that the circuit that's generated in the ASIC model is going to be too large? You could be asking about either. Uh, yeah, I was, I was asking, like, how, how much of the concern over the expressiveness could be handled by having a, you know, better com compilers that... Some. Compile I'll, I'll talk about that later. So, right. Um, so the answer, okay, so your question, I think, is how can we come up with, a, if we're willing to restrict the front programmability, can we still, can we then come up with more efficient circuits? Or conversely, if we want to expand expressiveness, can we have concise circuits for those things? I think that's your question. But if not, maybe you can ask me later, because I'd like to, okay. Um, all right, so as a reality check, I'm going to do a quick performance study. The, we're going to standardize on the back end. The back end is going to be the libsnark of Iran's group, BC TV's optimized implementation of Pinocchio. The front end will be my group's implementations or re-implementations of two of the ASIC-based approaches and then the best CPU-based approach, again, due to Ben Sesson, Chiesa, Tromer, and Virsov. To put this in context for the landscape, I'm going to be comparing the three shaded systems, Zatar Buffet and BCTV. And to do apples to apples comparisons, we'll run them on the same computations and the same hardware. Now, there's four questions that arise. The first two are what are the provers' costs and what are the verifiers' costs? And I'll answer that with a model based on micro benchmarks. The things to notice about this model, first of all, is that the proof length is actually quite small. And the per instance cost for the verifier to check things, is act, check computations, is pretty low. Not as low as we'd like, but it's still pretty low. But there's something else to note about this model, which is that the remainder of the performance picture, uh, the pre-processing cost for the verifier and the per instance uh, work for the, the prover, actually scales with the size of the circuit, meaning the number of gates. Now, that raises two further questions. The size of the circuit is given by the front end. So this raises the question, how do the front ends compare to each other? And also, you know, we've got constants in here like 180 microseconds, 60 microseconds. Is that good or bad? I don't know. So let's actually do a quick uh, comparison. What this graph is showing is for three different computations, matrix, multiplication, merge sort, whatever, uh, Newth, Mars, Pratt, uh, Pratt uh, string search, uh, the performance of the front ends normalized to the best of them, which is Buffet. And you know, when my group produced this graph, we're like, oh, this is awesome. Buffet is better than the other front ends by like two orders of magnitude. We're like patting ourselves on the back. This is fantastic. The thing is, a little bit of perspective is in order because if we compare all of them to native execution, like we're all terrible, right? I mean, what this says is like, yeah, we're better by one to two orders of magnitude, but basically, like, it's because we're all terrible. But actually, it's even worse than that, because I'm not even depicting actual data. The, this is extrapolated, because not all of the systems can even run at the input sizes that we're purporting to depict. So what's depicted on this slide are the actual input sizes that the various systems can handle. And as you can see, it's kind of <laughs> the input sizes are not as large as we would like uh, for these various systems. The bottleneck, you might be wondering about, is uh, in two places primarily memory at the prover and also in the verifier's pre-processing stage because there's a, at a certain point there's a large operation that has to be performed that's bottlenecked by memory. That means that we can't really handle computations that take more than 10 million gates. Uh, the pre-processing costs are also extremely high if you want to think about plausible applications. So some of these issues can be addressed uh, in theory but the concrete costs are high. So to, just to summarize the concrete performance, the front end, the CPU-based approaches are better in theory, but more expensive in practice. The verifiers' uh, variable costs are genuinely inexpensive. The provers' overheads are scary. And memory is a scaling limit. You might wonder, well, what about proof-carrying data work? This work recently appeared at, at uh, Eurocrypt. This work actually deals with the prover's memory bottleneck in principle uh, and asymptotically, but the concrete costs make it very difficult to imagine actually <laughs> deploying this anytime soon. GKR derived systems, that was the interactive proof I mentioned, actually have better performance for the verifier. The problem is that they're limited in expressiveness. OK, so where do we go from here? Well, one option would be to target domains where the prover's cost is tolerable. One of those would be the zero cache system that Iran, I think, will talk about. There, it's actually, we don't care if the prover's work is too high, because the whole point of Bitcoin is to make people spend CPU cycles. Another application, which is detailed in our work at SOSP, is an application of the machinery to location privacy. And for lack of time, I won't have time 
for lack of time, I won't dive into it, but I'll just point you to our paper, which describes this as an application where you could imagine actually paying these costs, because effectively, the size of the data in question is generated on human uh, scales, and so it's not very large. Another option, which is what I want to do with the remainder of my time, is try to motivate theoretical advances in this area. So what do we need? Well, at a high level, we would ideally like to have uh, three orders of magnitude reduction in the prover's cost and the verifier's setup costs. Ideally, we'd be able to handle inexpensively interactions with the outside world. Right? Real programs interact with operating systems, files, I.O. devices, et cetera. Right now, there's not a concretely efficient way to incorporate those interactions into the machinery. And ideally, in some context, there will be some organizations that would prefer to base the machinery on standard assumptions. This is, again, ideally. Things that could be viewed as a luxury or non-interactivity, depending on the application. Obviously, for some applications, non-interactivity is absolutely critical. But there are many other applications, like the tolling one, where it's OK if you have interactivity. It's also the case that pre-processing, while it would be nice to get rid of it, I'd deal with it as long as the costs aren't too high. And for that matter, I don't even necessarily care if the proof is of constant length. I tolerate larger proofs. And I tolerate a verifier that could work harder if we could get the concrete costs down. <laughs> So in terms of a wish list for theoretical advances, one interesting thing would be, if you remember the front end, back end decomposition, the front end is producing arithmetic circuits, and the back end is establishing the satisfiability of those. Could we develop probabilistic proof protocols that are targeted to different problems besides circuit satisfiability that have wide applicability? This requires identifying good candidate problems as well as identifying probabilistic proof protocols for those problems. A variant of this would be to take the general circuit satisfiability verification machinery, but incorporate or compose with it um, special purpose algorithms that outsource common pieces of, or, or I should say, pieces of computations that, are, that are, appear commonly, like, for example, cryptographic operations. And you know, Babis and Aline have done work in that area. Another thing, which may get to the question you had asked, Adam, is about more efficient reductions from programs to circuits. This is absolutely of interest. For the most part, this is in the domain of programming languages. But it's, I mean, I'd be thrilled if people here want to take this on. A second set of nice-to-haves would be concerning the back end. So first of all, can we the short PCP paradigm, where the verifier gets a commitment to a short PCP from the prover, that is a great idea in principle. Can we get short PCPs that are efficient and simple? Uh, I'm not the one to do that. I, I, some of you are, not me. It would be great if that existed. Another thing would be to endow IKO's arguments, those, the interactive arguments with the preprocessing, with better properties. So I, I don't know if these are covered by impossibility results. I hope not. But it would be cool if we could reuse. I mean, this is something I talked about with Daniel Wicks a while ago. Could we, and Avi Shalab, could we reuse? They did the talking. I did the listening. Could we reuse the processing work over more than a batch indefinitely? That would be ideal. Could we make the protocol zero knowledge? Could we make stronger assumptions? and or improve the analysis, because some of the costs in this protocol come out of the way that soundness is established. Another thing, uh, although the disclaimer is that Q QAPs and GGPR have come very far, but they are a principal source of cost still. So is it possible to improve them or to improve the cryptography that's sitting on top of QAPs? And finally, what would be cool, if you imagine, imagine that the cloud has special purpose processors that are really good at handling cryptographic operations. Well, I'm telling you that cryptographic operations are one of the key bottlenecks in these systems. So could we get to the point where the cryptographic operations could themselves be outsourced, and then the verifier would check that those cryptographic operations were done correctly? So there's a lot of other ideas needed, of course. Even if we make progress on all of those, it's not going to make this stuff plausibly deployable tomorrow. Uh, but we don't all know what they are. I'd be thrilled if I could motivate the, the graduate students in this room to think about this area and work on these problems. So to just quickly wrap up, I've tried to say or communicate that this is an exciting area that has both good news and bad news. The bad news is that implementation does not imply deployability. The overhead really comes from two places, the overhead of transforming programs into circuits and the overhead of the QAP backend and the cryptography layered on top of it. I believe we need theoretical breakthroughs. And uh, that's going to be a lot of work. It's a high bar. But as incentive, I think the potential here is very large. Um, if we had low overhead ways of verifying computation, the results would have wide applicability, I believe. 
Um, so I'll stop there and take questions if there's time. <laughs> While the next speaker steps up, maybe a question. Um, note that we will have a full hour discussion on all of these topics in the afternoon, so we can have more extensive discussions then. Um, so uh, my question is, uh, do you have a sense of uh, which of the overheads is bigger or the order of magnitude on them? So for example, if you stripped all the cryptography out and just did the PCP, but sort of assume the prover is something answering the questions. I know it doesn't make sense, but what would be the cost of that? Is the cost kind for just answering these PC queries or the, doing it in a cryptographic way is exponent? That's a really good question. It comes from two places. So if we just strip the cryptography out of it, the prover still and this cost can be addressed in theory using their stuff. Um, the prover still has to do a fairly large operation on the entire just QAP's mandate that the prover does um, polynomial arithmetic and finite uh, fast Fourier transforms on uh, the satisfying assignment. That's a bottleneck that would exist independent of the cryptography. Having said that, if you could get rid of the cryptography, you just have QAPs, no um, no crypto on top of it. The costs would go down. They go down. I mean, I'm I'm making this up, but my sense is like two orders of magnitude right there. So in running time, but not the memory bottleneck. To be clear. You mentioned um, problems that come up um, a lot that you would say if we had a special solution, like an ad hoc solution, <coughs> that wouldn't require the general purpose machinery, that then you could sort of plug it in, in the, and sort of reduce the overhead. What would be an example of that? Like, right. So, I mean, to some extent, we need to identify these, right? There are lots of computations I care about, um, you know, like the things that I use computers for every day. The question is what, you know, what is the commonality? What can be extracted such that we could have a good probabilistic proof system? And I actually don't know. There's something I definitely want to think about. Um, and one of the things I'd like to talk to people about. But, I mean, certainly if there were operations that could allow for transformations on, for example, databases, which if you think about are data structures that are, you know, stored. Right. Are rolling off the circuit, the, the program into a circuit. Are there structures in the resulting circuit that somehow uh, seem to take a lot of time or a lot of, uh, or they repeat themselves a lot? I see what you're asking. Okay, excellent question. So the question is what types, I think, of higher level program constructs translate into expense in the circuit representation? And Can you it, that with an ad hoc solution? Yeah, so I'm actually not sure. I mean, one of the things that tends to blow up, which is kind of a bummer, is that in the ASIC-based approaches, um, time and conditionality turn into space. So if you have an if statement or a switch statement with four different possibilities, the circuit now needs logic for each of those four possibilities. That's a bummer. Another thing that's more expensive than we'd like is, it sounds crazy, but inequality comparisons. If the computation needs to check that one number is less than another, it turns out that that introduces expense for um, reasons I could go into, but I think I'm out of time. Let's thank the speaker again. And